St. Patrick's Day is right around the corner. Can the politicians pass the budget and find the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow? We find out with State Representative Mike Hanna joining us next on For the Record. Commonwealth's attorneys and I have concluded that the NCAA sanctions were overreaching and unlawful. Someone's got to develop a product that you and I as a consumer are going to want to buy. The country needs a comprehensive energy. Good morning and welcome to this edition of For the Record. Once again, talking the Pennsylvania state budget. And to do that, we bring in State Representative Mike Hanna, the Democrat Minority Whip in the House of Representatives. Mr. Hanna, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, and thanks to our viewers for tuning in. We'll get right to it. Last year, you said something real, that I thought was really good on the show, that Washington, D.C. politics really don't come in to the Pennsylvania politics. Not to be the case so far this year, gridlock seems to be running rampant all along. Yeah, it's a, I, uh, I wish that I was, had been right a year ago <laughs> when I said that. Uh, for the first uh, 25 years of my uh, career, I was right. We didn't allow gridlock. We didn't allow that type of uh, uh, partisanship. But unfortunately, here in the last eight months, we've probably seen more of that, far more of that than, than we, we need. And hopefully, uh, we can eliminate it and get back on track and get a budget resolution. Yeah, definitely could see that with national politics. It's just taking a nasty, nasty turn. You see that with the presidential election going on right now. Specifically talking about the state budget, in your mind, what's the problem? Well, the biggest problem that we had here in the last three months is we had uh, we finally had come to an agreement before Christmas. We and unfortunately, uh, we had the speaker not honor that agreement, and that's that's terribly unfortunate for a number of reasons. Number one, uh, I don't believe that's ever happened in Pennsylvania politics before, where an agreement was reached in the negotiation level, mm -hmm. and then that nego then that uh, agreement was not validated at the. Uh, at the House level. And uh, what happened is the Speaker just wouldn't run the bill. The votes were there. Uh, the agreement had been reached. Uh, we had the votes to not just pass the budget, but also to pass the revenue package to pay for that budget. And all we needed to do was put those votes up on the board, and, and the matter would have been concluded. And unfortunately, the Speaker decided to pull the plug and not allow those votes to happen. We've heard on this program that the votes weren't there. We've heard that it fell apart because of the liquor bill, the reform, there was a property tax, and these things were getting pulled out. But what concerns me is that bill that was passed in the Senate was 31 to 19, had bipartisan support, and then Torzai, I, I, I believe, and in, in, this is mid-December, just doesn't call it to the floor. What, what there had to be some anger in the house when that happened on both sides absolutely there was I mean the reality is that the votes were there I mean we had demonstrated the votes were there I believe it was on December 22nd when votes were counted for uh, on second consideration the bill was actually a roll call vote which is unusual and there were a number of procedural challenges and the votes were put up I mean we showed that we could pass uh, the procedural challenges we could pass the uh, the actual bill on second consideration and we did that so we sh we demonstrated the votes were there uh, if there was a, a an outside issue that was affecting the budget bill and the mm -hmm. revenue bill it probably was more the pension issue than anything else uh, apparently when the republicans failed to pass their their own version of pension reform uh, that caused some uh, some problems within their caucus and that may have led more towards the uh, speaker's decision not to run the bill than anything but the, the fact of the matter is the votes were there we had uh, you know it was a small number of uh, republicans it was only probably around 28 of them that agreed to help pass the budget and pass the uh, revenue package to pay for that budget but they were there together with our approximately 78 or 80 votes more than enough to get things done and we demonstrated that on second consideration so it could have got done how much of the money is that is currently flowing if if the budget of would be a hundred percent passed it'd be a hundred percent how how much what percentage is currently in that is my understanding that the budget that the governor line item vetoed had about thirty point two to thirty point three billion dollars in mm -hmm. in the total budget that was, was sent to him the line item veto was probably somewhere in the neighborhood of six to eight billion dollars so it is about twenty four to twenty six billion dollars that are flowing uh... and those dollars um, have reached school districts, they've reached counties, they've reached uh, um, the state-owned universities, but not the state-related universities. So a lot of dollars have flowed, but there's a lot of dollars that are not flowing at this point. We have tremendous problem with corrections. 
We have a problem with school districts who now, although they got the first six months or seven months or maybe even eight months of funding, uh, are now likely to run out of funding sometime here in the next 30 to 60 days uh, and may not be able to complete this, this uh, school year. So those problems are cropping up now and have to be addressed. I want to talk about the school districts a little bit later. I want to go back, though, to the line item veto. Mm -hmm. Over the summer, I heard that Republicans wanted to do the line item veto early. Governor Wolf said no. Then Governor Wolf came back mm -hmm. and then said he wanted to do it. And the Republicans said, no, we're not doing it now. Mm -hmm. Why is there that hostility? And why couldn't that just be worked out? Because that, it, the line item veto seems like it would have been a simple solution if it took place immediately. Well, there's been a lot of problems there, particularly between the governor's office and, and the Republican leaders. Um, I think that uh, where we stand right now, uh, we can get this resolved as long as we focus on getting a, a budget that takes care of Pennsylvania's priorities, solves the structural deficit. That's the single big, biggest issue that we have to address here on the short term. And then we do want to start rebuilding uh, education. We need to reinvest in education. If we can do those two things, we can, we can move forward, not just for this year, but also into next year. So, you know, we need to get by the, uh, uh, the governor saying he doesn't want to do it this way and the re Republican leader saying they don't want to do it that way. And we need to get to a point where we just all accept that we have to compromise. We have to get this done. We can't continue to uh, have school districts have mm -hmm. uh, county uh, human service agencies not funded and not have the dollars that they need to operate. Real quick, what, what do you feel the sense of urgency is right now at this moment? Well, I think the biggest sense of urgency is with school districts, uh, Penn State is, and, and Pitt and Lincoln and Temple, they're the state related. They haven't gotten a dime, and that's, that's very serious. We have to address that. I mean, you've heard that Penn State has said that they, uh, their agricultural extension services will be dramatically affected in the very near future if they don't start receiving those state dollars. So we really need to get that resolved. The sense of urgency, I think, revolves around education and, and the problems that we will face if we don't get education properly funded. We are talking Pennsylvania state politics with State Representative Mike Hanna here on WHVL's For the Record. Welcome back to For the Record, talking Pennsylvania state budget. State Representative Mike Hanna, pleasure for him to be here. I, ho I hope it's a pleasure for you to be here, is I should say. Structural deficit, obviously that's a, that's a big part. Pennsylvania does have the deficit. Credit rating downgraded on the S&P. That's got to be fixed. Absolutely, and that's that's clearly the biggest issue in this entire budget discussion. Uh, you know, the, the, the I believe the consensus is that somewhere around uh, 350 to 600 million dollar deficit for this year alone, uh, compounded next year somewhere between 1.2 and 2 billion dollars, maybe t as high as 2.3 billion dollars is a structural deficit project projected for next year. We have to fix that. Uh, it's in the last five years, it's led to five credit downgrades. And, you know, folks understand what that means. That means that just like your own credit score, if, uh, if your credit score is downgraded, when you need to borrow money to, bu to buy a house or to buy a car or to do anything that you need to borrow money, even just for your credit card, that interest rate is going to be much higher if you have a lower credit score. And that's the same that Pennsylvania is now facing. Our credit rating has been downgraded five times, and we're paying far more than we need to for, for the dollars that Pennsylvania has to borrow. So we need to fix that. And, and it also is a reflection of what Standards and, and Poor's thinks of our uh, budgeting process. They keep saying that we fail to address the structural deficit that's existed for years. So it's, it's clear that we have to do something about this, and it has to be done now. We can't keep kicking the can down the road. It's, the time is now to fix this. Creative accounting only takes you so far and obviously could prolong the time that you have to make that. But when did that problem specifically start? You said five years. That takes us back into, into Governor Rendell. Is there something specific that we could point to at, at point A that said this is what started that problem? Well. The majority of the problem started with Governor Corbett saying that he would absolutely not sign any tax increases. Now, obviously, at some point in his, uh, in his tenure, he changed his mind because he did sign the gas tax. He actually was the biggest proponent of the gas tax in the end. 
But uh, during the, the budgeting process, when it came to the general fund budget, his, his office, his budget office, continually looked for ways around raising revenue, and they continually fought raising revenue. And as a result, they did a lot of things that ended up putting us in the situation we're in now. The best example I think you're familiar with, there's been some, uh, some recent publicity about the rebalancing that's been proposed. Mm -hmm. Rebalancing is, is a, 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 uh, an accounting gimmick where they actually take uh, something that's due in this fiscal year, this fiscal yep. year, and push it into next fiscal year, fiscal year, and just say, well, we're not going to make your last quarter payment in this fiscal year. You're going to get it next fiscal year. Well, rebalancing is the equivalent of kicking the can down the road. It's a, that what they're saying is we're not going to make that payment when it's due. We're just going to force it into another budget year where we hope we might have the revenue. That was done several years ago with Social Security payments for school, for school districts. You just can't do that, and that without it catching up with you at some point. Yeah, I do that with my own personal checkbook sometimes. So, uh, <laughs> but that, we're talking much less money than billions billions of dollars on that one. Going back to, to the education, obviously, the state related. I am a conservative, and I believe that sometimes colleges, they do waste money. I, I've been able to see that from where I went to school and things like that. But specifically the high schools. You have 24% of state education money possibly going to Philadelphia, which only has 12% of the students. I think that should be balanced out because I view state college students, Bald Eagle area students, just as important as a student in Philadelphia. Obviously, there's a little bit more expense down there. But at the same time, for the first time ever, we're having a Department of Ed send a letter out saying, if you have to close a school, this is how you have to do it. I mean, that's uncharted territory. Yeah, one of the things we try and look at as we look at our uh, uh, basic education funding formula is to ensure that the dollars are going where the state dollars are going mm -hmm. where they're needed the most. And certainly, you know, it's, it's, Center County is a good example of that. Uh, state dollars that flow to state college are less than they are to Bald Eagle area or to Phillipsburg or to Penns Valley or even to Belle Fawn. Uh, and the reason is because State College has the ability to raise mm -hmm. revenue, greater re amount of revenue locally. So that's part of what the educational funding formula is supposed to look at to try and draw a balance. And that's, that's part of the reason why you see the dollars flow to poorer school districts like Philadelphia, like Keystone Central. Uh, those school districts need the help that the state can provide. So that's what we try and do with the funding formula. Uh, the problem we have this year is obviously the dollars that were released by the governor in late December caught things up for the first half of the year and even started to help out in January, February of this uh, calendar year, but they're not going to get most school districts through the end of this year, and, and that's a real problem because those school districts have to have those dollars. They're not going to see tax dollars coming in until they send uh, property tax bills out in June, and then the, the, the bills aren't due until the end of August, beginning of September and October, so the real money doesn't flow till then. So they need the money now, and we're going to have to resolve that problem here in the next, in the very short order. Governor Wolf wanted $3.4 billion. The number that came in was 3.1. You're only 300 million off. Where does where does that come from? Well, one of the things that we looked at is a, a various revenue uh, packages, and you know there was a discussion about whether it should come from personal income tax. There was discussion, and you know the governor in his most recent budget address, one of the criticisms he got hit with was that he had seven tax increases in his most recent budget address. Well, I looked at the seven tax increases that were proposed, you know, I'm at the negotiating table, I know what's being said. Four out of the seven are taxes that have been proposed by the Republicans at the negotiating table. So the governor is just following up on the negotiations and where we were when things broke down in December. What he's proposed as the revenue package is really the revenue package that was negotiated last December. It includes a bank shares tax. I never even heard of that until the Republicans uh, proposed it. It includes uh, the, the tobacco tax, which, of course, uh, that was proposed a while ago, and it includes some other taxes. Can you explain the bank shares tax? Because that's the first that I, I'm unaware of what it is. I really can't. It's a, <laughs> what it is is it's a, it's a tax on banks because mm -hmm. that's who we're hearing from uh, on their, apparently on their capital. And that's something that uh, was proposed by the Republicans at the negotiating table. And, you know, since uh, t traditionally uh, big banks are a Republican constituency, we assumed that if the Republicans were proposing the tax, it was something that they were willing to accept and something that we could actually support. It's, d it's definitely a shame that it's come to this. And, you know, you're ba I don't want to say you're holding students hostage, Paul, uh, Harrisburg, but it is something that needs to be resolved and needs to be resolved quick. 
Yeah, um, absolutely. And, and, you know, the students are uh, our most important concern at this point. And it's, it's not just basic education, it's higher education as well. We can't complete this school year without getting this fund, funding out on both this basic education level and on higher education level. Going to talk some different topics with State Representative Mike Hanna. We'll talk marijuana, we'll talk PA liquor control, and who knows what we'll get to next. Stay with us, you're watching WHBL's For the Record. Welcome back to WHBL's For the Record. Over the next seven minutes, we are going to attempt to find $300 million, maybe a billion dollars. We don't know. State Representative Mike Hanna joining us. Representative Hanna, marijuana, it's always a hot topic. Across the nation, it's a hot topic. Colorado, they seem to be doing pretty well. Washington, Oregon, they seem to be doing pretty well. Where does it stand in Pennsylvania right now? Well, it's likely that medical marijuana will become law this year. And I would expect that the vote will probably happen the week of March 14th. And it's likely that it will pass the House, and I think pass with a significant majority. It's already passed the Senate. Now, the bill will be a little different. It's medical marijuana. It's, it's really to help kids and to help people who are suffering uh, with uh, diseases where medical marijuana has been proven to be a, a, a help. So uh, that would pass, I believe, the week of March 14th. Uh, would have to go back to the Senate to be reconciled with their bill and then uh, ultimately go to the governor, but he's indicated his support for a medical marijuana bill this year. So I think we can get this done and get it done this year. Some opponents of that, you read in the press that when there were hearings going on down in the Capitol, it got pretty heated. Some, some of those opponents were making insulting comments to parents who were coming and actually testifying about the need to have medical marijuana, medical marijuana for their children. Is that poor form to actually call parents out like that in hearings? Well, the, the purpose of the hearings is to give a forum where people can hear all sides of the debate. One of the things about the hearings that I thought was very helpful was the medical professionals who clearly demonstrated that there is a need for this and that they, it can be properly prescribed. So it will be treated just like a pharmaceutical drug and it will be uh, prescribed by medical professionals. And that's what the hearings were, I think the ultimate result of the hearings was to make sure that our bill followed a process that made sure that we, it was dispensed as a pharmaceutical and dispensed in a way that would protect the public. Any chance that this gets tied to liquor? Because Republicans have been for years that they want this liquor liquor board fixed in Pennsylvania. Yeah, uh, it, it's anything can be tied to anything in in, in Harrisburg, unfortunately. Uh, but the reality is, I, there's there seems to be a consensus growing around some liquor reform, and it's what I generally describe as liquor modernization. And what that is is essentially putting our existing state store system in a much more competitive atmosphere. And, and we can do that. We can help them generate more revenue for the state. And it just takes some minor tweaks to the law. And, and things like um, locations, making sure that as they open new locations, we put them in places that are more accessible to the mm -hmm. public. Uh, hours, making sure they're open the appropriate hours, including what, what a lot of folks want are Sunday hours. And those Sunday hours would be possible, particularly if some of these stores were located in or next to grocery stores that would be more appropriate. People do their grocery shopping on Sunday a lot in Pennsylvania. Uh, flexible pricing, one of the things that we have right now is a very rigid pricing system, which does not allow the liquor control system to price things to move them. Uh, you know, if there's great demand for something, they have to have the same profit margin on that item as there is for something that, no, that nobody wants. And we need to give them flexible pricing so that just like any other business, they can move stock that makes sense to move and price it accordingly. So the, all those things would generate more money as much as $100 million more dollars a year, which is really significant. What about the selection? That's always a complaint amongst people in Pennsylvania that you don't have the selection as you would in Maryland or you would in New York? First off, I'm not sure that's true. I mean, one of the things that, we, that I've learned about selection just through this whole debate process mm -hmm. is uh, Pennsylvania can get you most anything you want. Yeah, they uh, can. Yes, and if, you, if it isn't available in their store, and State College is very fortunate that they have, I believe, at least three stores, one of which is what's considered a high-end store that has some real, uh, some kind of exclusive brands that are available. So there are a lot of, uh, of, of selection available. Where it comes into a problem is with wine, I think. And with wine, there are some limitations on some wines, wineries getting their, their stuff into the marketplace here in Pennsylvania. And that's part of modernization. We can fix that. One of the things that I think everybody would like to see is wine in grocery stores. 
and it's possible to do that so that there is a broader selection. The problem with privatization is it may actually result in a lack of selection because, for instance, uh, in, in my district, the 76th district, there, are, uh, there, there were two, one is currently closed but re being reopened, two very small liquor stores in uh, uh, Snowshoe and one in Renova. Their, their selection was small, but it certainly took care of, of particularly the bars and the clubs that needed the, uh, the, the supplies from those stores. But they could also get things that people in Renova or Snowshoe wanted. Uh, if there was privatization, number one, I don't think either one of those stores would exist. Yes, yep. And if they did exist, they would exist to just carry a very, very small selection and they wouldn't have the ability to get the larger uh, selection at an affordable price for people. They wouldn't be able to even in provide additional selection. So I think there's a real concern that privatization would actually end up reducing selection, and that actually happened in the state of Washington. I'm a big fan of modernization. I personally don't feel that Pennsylvania should sell it off and go completely privatized, even though I did like how it was when I lived in New York. Is there, when, when do you see a timetable of this actually finally being resolved? Well, the, the budget because, mm -hmm. as I said to you, modernization could bring as much as $100 million in new money into the budget. $100 million is real money. As you and yep. I talked about earlier, uh, this year's budget deficit is projected on the low end to be $350 million, on the high end to be as much as $600 or $700 million. Well, $100 million is a big chunk of that. Sense of urgency maybe to get this done maybe mid-March with the, or end of March with the primaries coming up? I would think so, yeah, and I, and I don't know that the primaries are a motivating factor as much as, it, you know, a lot of us come back to the district uh, during petition circulating time and during these budget hearing times, and we have a chance to talk to our constituents, and guess what? We're finding out our constituents want a budget done, and they want it done now. So there's a real sense of urgency being delivered to legislators, and I, I think it will help us get this done in the short term. You mentioned the constituents real quick. A lot say, I don't mind paying my fair share, just don't overpay me. Has there been any pushback, you know, people coming into the offices recently with that? Yeah, we hear from all, from everyone. You know, there certainly are those who contact us and say, you know, the bottom line is don't raise my revenue. Uh, and then there's others that are saying don't cut services further. Don't, if you don't raise revenue on the state level, property taxes will go up and I'll have to pay more here. And that's more unfair than a state tax. Representative Hannah, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for watching at home. WHVL's For the Record. Have a great day, everyone.